surprise birthday party for your friend Mark, and you wanted to order 100 balloons, but you accidentally ordered 1,000, and you can't return them. So now you have 900 extra balloons, and you got to figure out what might you do with them. This is an example of a divergent thinking problem, and that's what we're going to cover today in this video. Divergent thinking is coming up with multiple solutions to a problem multiple uses for an object. So in our example, our divergent thinking problem was coming up with other uses for a balloon. Divergent thinking is similar to brainstorming or ideation. For example, there's over 1400 versions of Monopoly and there's over 43 quintillion ways to solve a Rubik's Cube. Divergent thinking is the foundation of all creative thinking. It's the idea that there's alternatives to what we've been given. There's other ways to approach life. Understanding divergent thinking can help change our perspective on life and how we approach problems. But before we dive in, let's take a look at a historical example that comes from George Washington Carter. George Washington Carter was an African-American scientist and humanitarian that lived in the late 1800s and early 1900s. One of his most notable achievements is coming up with over 300 uses for peanuts. Now that's important because at the time, peanuts weren't a cash crop. They didn't have any value to them. And so when Carver came up with over 300 uses, such as oils, lotions, installations, and things like that, people saw more value in the peanut and they started growing them more in the crops. This in turn helped him achieve one of his larger goals of showing farmers the benefits of rotating crops to regenerate nutrients each season. It's important to understand that not all of Carver's ideas worked and they weren't all tested. And we're gonna discuss the significance of that in a moment. But before we do, let's talk about where that childhood imagination went. We all know that kids are creative and that it disappears as we grow older. And there's a reason for that. Take this screwdriver, for example. When we come into the world, we have no idea what a screwdriver is. We don't know what it's used for. We've never seen one before. And that pretty much goes for all the things in our lives. So that's why children can see a screwdriver as a sword or a wand or a bridge for ants or a back scratcher or anything else. However, over time, that child was told that's not a back scratcher, that's a screwdriver. It's only meant for screwing in screws. That's not a sword. You need to use that to screw in screws. And so we're told this about everything. And so we begin to narrow down our understanding of how to use things or how to solve problems. And we begin to search for that one right answer. But that's wrong. We should still use our imaginations, coming up with fantastic alternatives or absurd ideas. And we're going to talk about that next. So far, we've talked about what divergent thinking is, coming up with multiple solutions for a problem or multiple uses for an object. But it's not that simple. We don't just think of ideas. There's four guidelines that we should follow that will help us be more successful, both individually and in groups, when we're coming up with ideas, when we're ideating, brainstorming, divergent thinking. The first guideline is to not judge ideas. Let's say we're trying to come up with ways to raise money for our organization, and someone offers the idea of running a car wash. Someone else might chime in and say, no, we tried that a few years ago, and it was a huge failure. That judgment of that person's answer just killed the flow and killed the safety of the room. Now everyone feels like their ideas are going to be judged. So don't judge ideas. The second guideline is to come up with absurd, ridiculous, wild, and crazy ideas. You might even think of impossible ideas. The reason for this is because if we only stick to what we know or what we've seen work before, we're not going to come up with those surprising and innovative solutions. Let's take an example of our fundraising problem again. We're trying to find ways to raise money for our organization. Someone says, what if we charge everybody $10 for unicorn rides? Everybody will want to ride a unicorn. That's impossible. It's never going to happen. It's crazy. It's absurd and ridiculous to even offer. 
However, perhaps somebody else in the room was in Walmart the other day, and they were walking down the toy aisle, and they heard a kid going on and on about unicorns. And while they were in the aisle, they saw this really cool, expensive toy. And maybe they generate the idea of, what if we buy this toy and then we raffle it off? Or what if we have an auction? If that first person hadn't offered the ridiculous and crazy idea of offering free unicorn rides, that second person might not have been able to make that remote or completely unrelated association. Or we might look at what is it about unicorn rides? How might we mimic this in another way that might help us make money? The third guideline is to think of lots and lots of ideas. You want to go for quantity over quality. The reason for this is because the first third of ideas that we generate are going to be pretty typical. They're going to be things that we've seen done before or ideas that have been proven to work. The second third of ideas are going to be a little more abstract, a little more creative. Because now we're stretching our imaginations and we're pushing ourselves beyond what we know. But it's that third third, that third third of ideas is where the most innovative and creative ideas come from. Think of George Washington Carver's example. He came up with 300 ideas or over 300 ideas. I guarantee that those last 300 ideas were far more surprising, creative, and innovative than the first 100 ideas. So come up with lots and lots of ideas. The final guideline is to build on the ideas of others. Especially if we're in a group or a team, it's a group effort. Everybody's involved. So if one person offers an idea and that sparks another idea and then another idea, everybody's contributed. Everybody's equally responsible for these ideas that are being generated. So if we worry about who came up with what idea, we might give ownership to one individual. Instead, let's give the group credit for coming up with the ideas and let's build on each other's ideas. Great, now you're all master ideators. You understand that divergent thinking is coming up with multiple solutions for a problem or multiple uses for an object. We learned how George Washington Carver came up with over 300 uses for peanuts. Then we talked about the four guidelines for divergent thinking. You want to withhold judgment. Come up with wild and crazy and absurd ideas. Go for quantity over quality and build on the ideas of others. Thanks for checking out my video on divergent thinking. If you come up with some ideas for how to use those balloons for your friend's birthday party, please leave them in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share the videos, and talk about it to your friends. I'd also like to thank Idea Trap for sponsoring this video. Idea Trap is a new app that helps capture, categorize, and develop inspiration you run across throughout your day. There are also articles and resources on creativity to support your creative growth. Scan the QR code on the screen or follow the link in the description to learn more and download the app.